Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'd just like to welcome you all here this afternoon and I would like to introduce you to our some of our digital champions and um, uh, that are going to showcase some of their work. So firstly, I just want to talk to you about this digital aid project that we have had our conference on all week. Uh, one of the very imp important outputs was um, the digital champion programme. So we've seen some of the really good work um, right through all of the seminars and on the conference schedule all week. And I'm going to uh, introduce you to three really good, um, I suppose, recent and graduates of the Digital Teaching and Learning um, module. It's a TIN credit module that all of our uh, champions completed as part of this programme. So um, I suppose uh, I just want to, uh, part of this is just showing their exemplary and good work and how they've led in their really, really good use of tools, technology, and I suppose a lot of our colleagues, they've helped an awful lot of their colleagues and as part of this, I think about 45 digital champions now um, as part of this digital um, digital aid programme. So um, I suppose I'm ready to hand over to our first, uh, our first digital champion. I think he's online. Brian, I think Brian is online. So I just run through maybe just quickly what they're going to cover today. So first of all, we've Brian and he's going to look at H5P. Then we have um, Aoife, who's here on site. And then we have Helen, who is um, going to look at um, the Oscar scorecard, and she's coming from uh, Donegal. So um, three very um, interesting uh, uses of technology, and I hope you enjoy that. Okay, um, Brian's not here. Am I start with Helen? Brian is what? Brian, if Brian's not there, start with Helen. If Brian's not there, Helen's not here. He's live. I think he joined on Teams, not on his presenter. Perfect, okay. Let's Lovely. Let's we'll start with Helen, so. Thanks. So Helen was one of the recent graduates of um, the Digital Teaching and Learning uh, module, just this, uh, this uh, last group of digital champions. And we saw two uh, great champions this morning as well. We saw Marilla and we also, or yesterday, and we also saw, um, uh, this morning we saw um, Ulrich. So here she is, there's Helen. Great, so I'll pass it over to Helen. Hi, Annette, how are you doing? Hello, everybody. Um, I think I had, I had sent a recording of my presentation and demo as advice, so do you want to roll that? Do you want to use the recording or do you want me to go ahead myself? I've already sent a recording of the My name is Helen McConnell and I am an assistant lecturer in computing in the um, Letterkenny campus of ATU Donegal. I'm also 2022 digital champion, um, having just completed the level nine certificate in teaching and learning. And I'm going to present and demo two tools that are used to um, design new modules or um, update existing or redesign existing modules. And they're the Oscar scorecard and the ABC learning design method. Okay, so first of all, the Oscar scorecard is a course level quality rubric. It has a checklist of 50 instructional design and accessibility standards to review and improve your module. It, you know, there is a customized version which was created by the ATU Galway Teaching and Learning Office. All right, and I will demo that um, in a little while. The ABC learning design method then, you know, this was introduced by uh, Dr. Karina Ginty to GMIT or ATU Galway in 2018, um, more in a, like a, in a workshop um, method so that they could redesign courses, but it's also used for redesigning modules as well that are moving online. It uses a visual storyboard and, you know, with six categories, and those categories are acquisition, collaboration, discussion, investigation, practice, and production. So the acquisition is, you know, where the learners listen to the lectures or podcasts, you know, they're reading or researching, watching demos or videos. Collaboration is taking part in the knowledge building process via discussion. Discussion, class discussions on ideas and questions. Investigation is where the learner reflects on the concepts and ideas being taught. Practice is putting the learning into practice and learning from feedback that you receive. And then production is where, you know, the learners consolidate what has been learned and show their current understanding and practice of what they've learned. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to show you the Oscar scorecard. 
All right, so the Oscar scorecard here, as I said, you know, it has a checklist of 50, you know, um, instructional design uh, questions. All right, so this is just so where you can check and you can go through this with your existing module or if you're creating a new module, what you need to achieve. So here, you know, in my case, I was redesigning an e-commerce module. So it was an existing module that I had that I wanted to redesign. And also it was part of an assignment for the um, for my level nine course that I that I completed. So I went through the each of the checklists. So I've highlighted in yellow here the, the items that I found that I had to revise and you know um, and, and revisit. Okay. So I've, you can see here that you know the questions are all on the left, and then there's you know there's little uh, columns here. You know revisions, no revision needed, minor, moderate, or major revisions that are needed. So I went through each of those. And um, as I said, you know, some of the areas that I that I noted was I had, it, you know, I was going to add a nice welcome um, video. I added a proper lesson plan for each of the weekly lectures. You know, I re, you know, I, I made sure that I had an induction folder in there with, you know, module information, making clear, you know, what what the expectations are for the module and also a module handbook. I also made sure that I converted my slides to PDF so that the students could uh, print them out easier. Uh, other areas that I made improvements on were, you know, adding information for, you know, some of the practical, you know, software that I was going to be reviewing or we were going to be learning in the class. And, you know, just giving the students an option to look at external areas for that if they wanted to pr progress with that in the future. Uh, you know, we, you know, made sure that we, get, you know, gave the students as much information as we could, you know, expected times for lecture feedback and also added a discussion forum so that the, the group could have discussions um, separately. So that was the Oscar scorecard. So that was used initially going through those. I made some of those changes, but along with that, I also used um, the ABC learning method. Now, the ABC learning method uh, using those six categories, uh, you know, you can see here I've broken them down into the acquisition, uh, collaboration, uh, discussion, investigation, practice and production. So I took these. Now I am using Padlet here, which was another tool that I learned um, during the course of my level nine certificate. And, you know, this is a really useful tool also, but, it was, you know, I found it useful to use it for the ABC learning method. Having come from working in the industry and you know, uh, you know, using an agile delivery method. This reminded me very much of our agile storyboards that we used, and I found it very beneficial and an easy way to help um, just, you know, visualize the module. So I took this just, uh, you know, here I'm just showing an example of three weeks that we had that we had done. So I went through each of the learning methods. So for acquisition, I wanted to make sure I had face-to-face -face presentations. I had, you know, um, set up, we, you know, we use the Blackboard um, VLE. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that I had the session set up, live lectures and recordings, live demos, Panopto demos, online quiz using menti.com. So I would have incorporated these into, um, you know, the first week module. So I had an introduction video, um, you know, outlining the e-commerce syllabus and the, the, the e-commerce module handbook. All right, so I wanted to make sure that each of the practicals that we did, I did a short, you know, demo video on those um, to make it easier for the students that they, you know, could revisit any time because, you know, a lot of the students may, um, you know, may pick things up faster than others. So it's always good to have that short, you know, the short demos to um, allow. Hello, my name is Helen Michelle, and an easy way to help um, just, you know, visualize the module. So I took this just, uh, you know, here I'm just showing an example of three weeks that we had, that we had done. So I went through each of the learning methods. So for acquisition, I wanted to make sure I had face-to-face -face presentations. I had, you know, um, set up, you know, we use the Blackboard um, VLE. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that I had the session set up live lectures and recordings, live demos, Panopto demos, online quiz using menti.com. So I would have incorporated these into, um, you know, the first week module. So I had an introduction video, um, you know, outlining the e-commerce syllabus and the, 
the, the e-commerce module handbook. All right, so I wanted to make sure that each of the practicals that we did, I did a short you know, demo video on those um, to make it easier for the students that they you know, could revisit anytime because you know, a lot of the students may, um, you know, may pick things up faster than others. So it's always good to have that short, you know, the short demos to um, allow the students to revisit, you know, the video. So the collaboration then, you know, we, I introduced online forums um, in, in relation to the e-commerce. I wanted to do a little icebreaker. So, you know, I just asked a question, what was, you know, what did they last buy online? I, you know, I let the students do some competitor research by shopping online, you know, that was great fun. Uh, and then in relation to the investigation, so, you know, we did some, you know, research online, you know, usually in the form of breakout rooms and, you know, the teams work together, the, you know, the, the, the teams work together. And we also recorded our results using the Padlet as well. Discussion then, this is where we had our face-to-face -face lecture, group-based discussions, forums, and, you know, discussion groups. We had some asynchronous learning as well. The practice was where we had the WordPress practicals, the Panopto demos, the group research, and you know some quizzes using menti.com. And then for the production aspect, we you know we were you know this was where they put their you know their learning into practice. We you know their assignments consisted of creating an e-commerce business strategy and also creating an e-commerce um, website. So their practicals had you know helped this. Um, you know, help build up their skills in this. So that is both the Oscar scorecard and the e-commerce um, or the e-commerce uh, ABC learning method. And I am also available for questions if you have any. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks. And if anyone has any questions, maybe if anyone has any questions for Helen, maybe pop them in the chat. We might do the questions towards um, the end. If that's okay with everybody, we'll be finished after the three speakers. So I'll hand you over to Eva, maybe. Yeah. Thanks, Eva. So my name is Eva O'Brien, and I'm with the School of Engineering, the Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department, and I teach maths and stats. So I'm just wondering, I'm going to do a demonstration today of how I use closed questions to teach descriptive statistics. So it's just one example of how closed questions can be used. Uh, I'm hoping the screen will start sharing here, so I can... Yep. The laptop screen. This one. That's not, that's no, Helen's. that's Helen's, yeah. Thanks, Kevin. You sure assured me this would be easy. <laughs> it's not a slideshow, it's, it's a, slide a demonstration. Show. Can you share? Mm -hmm. Browser, yeah. Good to go, fine. Apologies. Okay. 
That's what I get now for trying to break the mould and not give a presentation and use a demonstration instead. So, as I said, what I want to show here is how I use closed questions to teach descriptive statistics. And necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, Trish O'Connell, my esteemed colleague, or one of my work wives, as I call her, um, at the start of COVID, she had to assess descriptive statistics. And uh, our, another one of our colleagues here, Sean, showed her how to use a closed question. And she then passed it on to me. And I thought, that's a great idea. So I then annoyed Sean for another while until I got my head around them. Uh, so thanks to Sean, I got this one up and running. Um, check your understanding of the basic functions in Excel. So there's two things I'm going to demonstrate here. One is the learning question, and then the other is the assessment question. So thanks to another colleague, Fiona Malone. She kindly passed on her H5P here on how to use the Excel tools. So I embedded that into my course. And then with the closed question, which has embedded data in it, um, a student can learn how to use Excel for descriptive statistics. So that every student on the course will download the same data set file here. Uh, they open up their Excel file. And really, once they're within Excel, you know, I don't mind if they use the statistics plugin. If they discover that, that's great for them. But I guide them through with the question here. Use the average function to find the mean of the data. Use the mode mult function to find the mode and median and so on. And the student has unlimited attempts at this to try and get it right. So once they input their answers, they're doing their calculations within that Excel file. Here they have the length of stents produced by machine A. And I tried to use real data from colleagues um, so the students are get it, getting real data to work with. And as I said, they have unlimited attempts and they can all help one another with that. Now, how does it work? The embedded data is available on my Moodle page, and I'll discuss this further in a few minutes, and how I set up the question. So once the, um, once the student has got to grips, as I said, they have unlimited attempts here to get it right and uh, see how to use Excel to calculate the basic descriptive statistics, they can then come down to their quiz. And this is the beauty of this, of course. One of the problems is, you know, copying and not wanting them to copy. So there's a number of questions in the quiz. So this is different. It doesn't guide them through how to do it. They should have learned how to do it. Um, oh, this worked this morning. It let me into it when I checked it, and now it's, it's closed. Apologies. I'll just change the settings. to me and we'll do apologies I thought that was open this morning don't know what I did so here's my quiz block and I'm going to enter into my quiz now as a student attempt the quiz now and the students are warned that while their data might look similar to the student they might be attempting it with that there's a lot of actual different data sets that underlie it so here now, for example, this one is a length of stents as well. That's just because it's a random question. There's about 12 different data sets in there, and they all vary slightly. So they might look the same, but I've changed numbers throughout them, so the answers are different. So again, now the student must go and use this spreadsheet to calculate mean, modes, medians, whatever the learning outcomes are. And they enter their answers here within the closed question and finish their attempt. So the as I said, the clever part of it for me was the embedded data within the closed question. So they are available here. You can, for me, I have all this data hidden from the students, but available on my course page. So that's what allows me to insert the hyperlink to the different data sets. So I thought I'd finish by just maybe showing how easy it was to use and set up. Apologies for all the scrolling now. Um, so within my question bank here, I have 12. This looks, it does look very different on this laptop. It's amazing, really. Um, I had all this set up and ready on my own laptop this morning. So I, you can see I have a number of closed questions written. And I write them for past exam questions. And I've used another colleague of mine from Maths 1. We've written a number of closed questions for Maths 1. 
So I'm just trying to find the one I had open here to edit it. So it's just to give you an idea of how easy it is to change them. So you copy your hidden data set in here and you can simply break a link and insert a link to whatever data set you wish to insert. And then in here, I can insert all the correct answers. The code for this I found very easy. Now I do have a background in coding, um, but it's all available online. And of course our learning technologists are fabulous at supporting us whenever we get stuck. Uh, I do find I probably wrecked Sean's head at the start of these, but really once you get one up and running, you can duplicate it and create numerous ones of them um, very quickly and very easily. So I just add them all the time. So this semester for, um, I've run it now with two rounds of students. Uh, so this semester, just every week I'd pop in and add another one into it uh, just to um, create different versions for the students. So that's it really, it's just, they can be, as I said, used for more than just descriptive statistics. I did present um, as part of our module and somebody said for accountancy they would find it very useful. Uh, and I said I found it very useful for past exam questions, especially for maths, where a student likes a final answer and they like to know whether it's right or not. So what it allows the students to do is attempt the question, put in a final answer, it auto-corrects, and then the student come back to me through one note with anyone that didn't give them the correct answer and I can give them feedback then for it. So it just it lessens the um, the work in correcting uh, past exam questions when the students are attempting them. So I found them very useful. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much Aoife and for sharing such a, a really great example uh, of a robust assessment um, using, um, you know, MCQ. And I love the feedback as well. You know, if a student gets it wrong, they know why they got it wrong. So thanks again for sharing that um, uh, Aoife, that was brilliant. So yes, we're ready for Brian. So our third um, speaker is um, Brian Power from uh, coming live from Sligo, and he's going to uh, talk to us about active learning with um, H5P. Thanks. So here he is. <laughs> Great. Um, I was supposed to be the first, but uh, yeah, third is not too bad. So can you still all hear me? Ah, great, okay. The, the sound just went on me there for a second. Yeah, sound is perfect, yep. Okay, well good afternoon everybody. So my name is Brian Power um, and I'm going to be presenting for the next 10 minutes on active learning and what it is, uh, why it should be used and how you can facilitate or uh, implement it uh, within a module using H5P. So first of all, like any particular topic, we need to know what we're talking about. So active learning as, a, as opposed to passive learning is where essentially students um, can do as opposed to knowing. So they're doing, they're actively engaged in um, their learning instead of listening or just uh, taking notes on a particular topic. So if we just look at a bit more. So active learning could be considered as problem-based learning is another term that's commonly used learn by doing, as I just mentioned, it's also called inquiry-based learning or cooperative learning. And it's where you, you problem solve, you debate, you try and mind map uh, during a particular session. So that's what it is. And really what we are most interested in, or what I'm most interested in during the development of, of this particular concept using H5P was why it's uh, so important. And what fascinated me about it was that it really aligns with uh, higher order thinking skills. So it's, it's really um, attuned with later stages of, of development um, in a student's critical thinking capacity. So this is the, the ripples on a pond model of student learning. Um, and so it really hits into the, the core of that pond in terms of doing. So another, so if we just look at here, another uh, illustration of that, it's 90% of, of what we say and do essentially leads to uh, information retention. So it's really good for not just the system might be set up that students just remember what the, what they, they learned through, through an exam um, if we're just passively listening to lectures, whereas we're doing, if we're doing active learning, it's more that they um, will, will retain it over the long term, which is what we want. And just to, to 
highlight it even further. Learning essentials, which is our core business, it's not really about, it's a bit about the teaching, but it's more about what the learners do. So my whole thinking, uh, getting into this and, and reading more about it and actually applying it in, into my own teaching, um, it's not about the sage on the stage. So although we might want to think that we know it all, um, we don't. Um, and it's more about what the, the, the learners do that really determines what they learn. So it's about giving ownership uh, to the students, to the learners themselves. And John Holt is a, an educationalist uh, from America, and he's a, a pioneer of homeschooling. Um, now, I won't be talking about that topic, uh, beyond the scope, but this is just a very good uh, quote that um, is really encapsulates the whole uh, point of this particular um, lecture. And so other reasons why it should be done, it improves all our outcomes that we're interested in, retention, student satisfaction, uh, it improves students' uh, behavioural and effective um, domains when, we're, when it comes to um, assessing students. So what I mean by effective, it improves their satisfaction, it improves their self-efficacy, their confidence, it improves their identity, the, the value that they place in learning. And when I talk about uh, behavioural domains of, of, of student outcomes, I mean their engagement in a class, their participation, their attendance at a class, they're all improved um, with attending um, and applying um, active learning or uh, active teaching strategies. So now we get on to the how, and this is what I've, I've done through the, through the digital teaching and learning module. Um, so what is H5P? So H5P is, is really a contemporary open access resource that you can access through that link. Um, it can also uh, act, be used as a plugin uh, within Moodle, and so it's integrated in Moodle. And this is just an interface um, of the actual, um, what, what you see. And so it's a really, it's user friendly. Um, so before any, and my experience using H5P, I would have seen it and said to myself, this looks really, really nice. It looks really professional, it's very slick, but not have the gumption or the, the confidence, I suppose, to um, actually go about doing it myself. I thought it was the, the, within the remit or within the gift of, um, information technologists um, or design instructors. Uh, but I quickly learned that actually that's not the case because the people that developed this know that there's not enough of those specialists around and we need to all be able to use these particular resources. So um, it was really um, an eye opener that of how, how easy it was. And I'm no tech savvy person as it might, uh, I might have alluded to earlier on by not being able to access the, as the first speaker, but it's, I quickly got into the, to the, the train of thought to use this particular resource. And so just to give you an overview and to kind of, I suppose, sell it, and I don't have any commercial interest in this as a technology, but it has a load of functions. So these particular functions um, can be used within um, H5P. So it's not just your, your typical quizzes, your, your, your videos or your question sets. You can also get uh, students, for example, so let's say they're a bit like a, a podcast, they're listening, but you can actually get students to answer um, so if you have a quiz, instead of just drag, dr dropping and dragging, you can get actually to speak uh, a bit like an Alexa type scenario. Um, and students like that. Students like something that's uh, things that are convenient. And I know that from feedback, it's also been uh, widely published. They want something that's convenient, that's quick, that's accessible. Uh, they're using gadgets all the time. Um, and so it's just an, I view H5P as a, an upskilling in uh, PowerPoint skills. You're doing the same thing. So if we go back to, this interface, you're doing the same scenario, organizing your, your images, organizing your wordings, organizing the sequencing, you're just doing it on a different platform. And that has been, in my reading, one of the main barriers to the use of active learning strategies such as H5P is that people think it's um, too daunting, there's too much effort required to do it, but it's essentially what, what we're doing already. Um, developing PowerPoint is just another way, a more slick way, I would argue, a more professional way to present information. And it also can be used for their own independent learning. Now, I haven't kept track of time, so please let me know when, when I should pause and stop. Um, so this is really an output of, of what I developed using H5P. Um, so this is the opening gambit of the heart. So it just it's, um, it's very useful for concepts. So if we think about scaffolded learning, where we have different concepts of um, learning that build up and scaffold towards the ultimate learning outcome that we want students to achieve, there might be building blocks towards achieving that learning outcome. And so one of the, the topics that I teach is about the cardiovascular system. Um, and so we talk about the anatomy of the heart. So it just gives a, an explanation. And at the very end, then it's a drag and drop of the heart. 
based on the previous six slides, they then go to the, the seven slide, which is here, you can see seven of eight on the bottom there. And it just really immerses themselves actively in thinking about what they've just read previously, which is different to just getting slides and reading them and then going away and logging off. They're act actively actually doing something. And so really, and they get a score then at the end to see how much uh, they're right. So they identify their gaps in learning through that. And so the, the key takeaways, so let's see if I can move yeah, my image here. Um, so it's not about teaching, it's about what students want, it's about what the students are learning. Um, it's really about trying to think about how we can meet expectations of students that's both engaging and can contribute to learning. Um, it's really all about activities and making it um, attractive, appealing and effective. Um, and it's all about making sure that our activities are aligned um, with what we want to know and what we want students to know. And we also need to accept our own uh, limitations, our own scope. It won't work out the first time. There might be an initial time effort spent, but the cost of that quickly turns into an opportunity, quickly turns into a benefit in terms of students' outcomes, as I've just shown on one of the previous slides. And lastly, and most importantly, um, it's really important to get students involved. Um, so what I intend to do after this uh, digital learning module is actually sitting down in the first lecture, asking students what concepts that align with the module descriptor they would like to see in a H5P format, um, what's their priorities and their preferences, and then tailor H5P content um, to their uh, learning needs and preferences to get them more engaged and active within the, the learning process. And there's some references um, if you want to read them. And if anyone would like to talk to me afterwards, um, don't be a stranger. You can contact me on uh, email or on Twitter. Um, and hopefully I'll see you around some of the campuses in the next two days in the future. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay, thanks, Brian. That was a really good example of um, learning using H5P. So a lot of our colleagues and digital champions have been using H5P. And again, that's a lovely example just for engaging the student and enhancing their own uh, learning experience. So um, I just wonder if there, anyone has any questions uh, for any of uh, our three speakers. Are there any online, Jessica? Um, yeah, we have, a qu we have a question here, yeah. Just for if, when you, when you were choosing from the data set in the Excel, was this manually or automatic, automatically done for the students? Like, if you have the Excel data set, you were changing it for, for the students in the quiz. So was this manually? Uh, no, it's automatic. So each, there's uh, about 20 questions in a bank, and each question in the bank has a different embedded data set. So I have all the data sets on the Moodle page. They're hidden from the students, but they're made available to the questions. The major disadvantage, I would say, is moving it between your Moodle pages. So I had it set up there on my lecturer sandbox. I employed it in two different courses this uh, year, and you have to recreate the links in each course, and that's quite painful. Uh, I'm not sure. I was hoping maybe I'd come back to Sean yeah, and be careful on that and see if there's... I have a solution. You have a solution. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be using this for my robotics courses because we have different coordinate systems. This would fix it so I think I bug you or show. Yeah, you. Yeah. Happy to share. We're at the same department, Jack. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, we'll sit down. Yeah, no, It's brilliant, you know, when you learned. I learned from Trish. Um, you know, we learn from one another and it's just, it's to get ideas and I suppose for me, I felt after doing the course was not to become overwhelmed with everything that's out there and pick and choose what works for you and it definitely works very well for quantitative models. Yeah, I hear about it, but seeing it and how easy, like, it's so It's very easy once easy. it's set up and very reusable, yeah. And the students actually really liked it, yeah. All right, thanks Aoife. Uh, any more questions? Uh, just to say that somebody online, um, film, you know, film our lecturing on AT of Galway, he uses closed questions in Moodle for a stats module, business analytics, uh, as well. So he said you guys might swap notes sometime. Uh, he shared that resource with us, so just email to Yeah. Lovely. Okay, thanks very much, folks, and uh, uh, thanks to our three speakers. Um, any other questions or comments? No, I just want to say about well, John, Aoife, and Brian, and Helen, you know, you're fantastic. I know you worked with a group of 14, was it this? this yes. Um, and well done to you, their key mentor yeah. and facilitator. But amazing work you've done, Aoife and Helen and Brian. 
So um, well done. We'll all, they'll all be following you across the ATU looking forward. <laughs> yes, well done, and it was great. Yeah, and it was great to have a presenter from each of the campuses yeah, as well. You know, we had Sligo and Letter Canine Galway. So thanks to everybody for their contribution, all their great work. So we want to applause.